Hello and welcome to The Lens with me, Sarah Travers. The Lens is a business in the community podcast. Now in this special one-off episode, we'll be meeting with Business in the Community's new Chief Executive, Mary McLeod, to discuss the future of responsible business in the UK. As we know, there are a plethora of current challenges for business out there. And how can businesses not just survive, but thrive and fully meet these challenges for the benefit of people? and of the planet. So to find out, it's great to have you with us. Let's get into the conversation. Mary, you're very welcome to The Lens. Thank you, Sarah. Lovely to be here. And lovely to meet you. Congratulations on the new role. We just want to get a sense of who you are. Uh, Many people will know you from your background in politics as an MP, but I'd love to know a little bit about your journey to date. How did you move from business to politics and now to CEO of Business in the Community? I was born in London, brought up in the north of Scotland and studied at Glasgow, but have mainly worked in London ever since, although my roles have taken me around the world in Europe, North America, Latin America and Asia. I started in consulting with Anderson Consulting, now Accenture, doing human performance and technology-led major change programmes, and and then moved to investment banking operations in Abin Amro, where I was global chief of staff and COO. I was then elected to be a member of parliament in 2010 and worked inside the UK government with the Minister for Women and Equalities, for Culture, Media and Sport, Policing and Justice, and in the Northern Ireland office. So much of the work of an MP is working in the most deprived communities and helping people who are struggling the most. And it also took me around the world to campaign and address big issues on violence against women and girls, female feticide, and have taught IT to young people on the streets. So having been a consultant, banker, politician, campaigner, I then continued as an advisor to the Secretary of State for Scotland and then moved to a UK leadership role in Corn Ferry as a senior partner in executive search. So in essence, finding, assessing and developing the best leaders to take on the most challenging roles in industry, government and society. So much of what I've done throughout my career has led to where I am now because at the heart of what I have done has been about transforming businesses, engaging leaders, driving better outcomes in society. And that's what I see my role at BITC being. Business in the community, it's about working with leaders, engaging hearts and minds in business and government and civil society to transform lives and transform our local communities right across the country. Well, there are so many challenges out there. What would you see as being your key areas of focus Well, of course, there are so many big challenges, disruption, uncertainty, volatility, and the complexity and scale and pace of change is increasing. And whether that's about geopolitical unrest, war, threats, the economic circumstances we're in, the ongoing humanitarian crisis, the need for transformation and innovation within organisations, the impact of data, AI, ESG, diversity. There are so many issues that need to be addressed. What really this BITC can do is looking at society and communities. It's that combined power of business that is needed now more than ever. So it's addressing the soaring cost cost of living, all the job losses that companies are having to go through due to the change in economic circumstances, the challenging inequalities in society, well-being, mental health, loneliness, anxiety, and also that lack of hope and a vision for the future. And given there is a vacuum, we need to be that voice of hope in the world to give people something to believe in. It is all about transforming lives and communities. So how do we do that? We need to engage at least 10,000 leaders over the next 10 years. We want to work in communities and transforming 50 places across every region and nation. And by being more vocal about what we do and therefore extending our network to over 50% of the workforce. So we need to start all of these actions now and we need to be focused, extend that outreach, be more visible and share the stories of impact 
Because what is really inspiring are the stories that our businesses tell, that beneficiaries tell of, of how their lives have been changed, how their organisations have been changed, what has been better for them. We will absolutely be addressing things like the cost of living by continuing the, the National Business Response Network. We will focus on greater social mobility. But for now and, and in the long term, we also, of course, need to be looking at how we deliver climate action more quickly as organisations transition to net zero. So there's a lot to do. Yeah, there is a lot to do. Do you find at times of crisis that people gravitate more towards you? We can achieve so much more together than we can individually. And therefore, if you truly believe in purpose and impact and what you can do as an organisation to make your own organisation the best it can be, how you can have that societal impact and environmental impact out there in society and in the local communities, if you really do want to change lives of those in the communities that you live and work, then this is the way to do it. And we can do so much by working together. And we can see that in some of the results that we've seen over time. Um, so that is with the Ban the Box campaign that we won 1.1 million extra roles. We've supported 3,000 work placements for refugees, over 1,000 signatories in the Race at Work Charter. The MBRN programme supported 2 million people during COVID. We've taken 25,000 leaders out to see and be inspired by what's happening in the community. So a lot has been done. And that's why we're just saying we're living in a world where if we work together to drive change, we absolutely can do so much more. And that's what we want to do and be part of. Now, you've already talked about leadership, but I wonder in terms of you being a leader now of a charitable organisation, given all of the challenges that we've been talking about, how do you feel about taking on that role? Well, of course, the important thing for me is that I've got an incredible team who believe passionately in what they do and have the experience to go and help businesses shape their future. We've got an amazing network of purposeful business leaders who truly want to drive this sustainable change transforming businesses, lives and communities. So we've got a track record of it. And therefore, we can only build on that foundation to scale and do it at pace because the need is there. The role for business in the community is now needed more than ever. You mentioned there, seeing is believing. What actually is that? Can you tell us a bit more about it? Seeing is Believing is a programme that we've run for many years and, and it's about taking senior leaders and CEOs out into the community to really let them feel and see. It's just about hearts and minds, really understanding the deprivation, the societal issues and challenges for themselves. But on the other side of it, showing them how they can be part of the solution, showing them how that we can transform that, showing them the, the programmes and the campaigns that have been run to really implement that transformation and that they can be part of it. And I've spoken to so many of the leaders who've been involved in those programmes and they say not only have they felt that they've been part of driving change through BITC, but it has transformed their lives too, because it's given them a focus, it's shown them a path for how they can go and be part of this change that they want to see in the world and the communities around them. And therefore, they can inspire so many others, their own organisations and also colleagues and peer groups and the networks that they have to make sure that more are brought in to deliver real sustainable change for the future. And are there any standout moments for you from what you've seen already? I visited Blackpool to see the really incredible work that has been done. Initially looking at the vision and pulling together and convening and connecting together all the key decision makers who needed to be there as part of defining that vision for Blackpool for 2030. But that was government, local government, central government, business leaders, civil society, bringing together those organisations who could work together to drive action and then creating the strategy around it, helping support the implementation 
documentation of the work that's been done and driving that forward. And it was just mentioned by one of the members of parliaments in the House of Commons recently, how it couldn't have been done without business in the community. We can't do it unless we have the businesses coming and supporting the work we do, having the business leaders to help drive that change in their own organisations and also in the local communities where they work. Huge amounts has been done, but literally there is so much still that needs to be done and we just need to be focused on that, really talking about what we do, being more vocal, more ambitious and doing more outreach and being that voice of hope around the country so that we can actually be that change and, and see that change and that impact that's been driven. You think your background as a politician and indeed an MP, do you think that brings you closer to government and change that's needed? Do you feel that that has um, helped you in this particular role as chief executive? I think what it did give me is a real deep understanding of local communities. But I think people forget when they think about politicians and they don't always have the best name. But the majority of politicians are good people who want to literally change and make a difference to their local communities. And what I did was spent a lot of my time doing and helping those who needed it the most. So being out and driving the sort of case studies and creating work placements and doing jobs fairs and volunteering awards and things that literally was bringing to life the, the local community. And I still work on the Women's Business Council for the, for the government and also the G20 Empower Alliance to improve the women's economic empowerment around the world. And, but that helped me think about the challenges in society. And that's why I still do work on neurodiversity. I still do work in social mobility and helping young people and, and also on diversity, helping senior women in the city, because there's just where all of us can have, I feel, a real responsibility to help others, give them the opportunities, give them the confidence to be the best they can be to, to achieve their full potential then we've made a little bit of a difference in the the world we live in. You definitely come across as a strong advocate of diversity and inclusion um, and a real voice for perhaps those who are more marginalised. Tell me a little bit more about your work around your diversity as this advisory board member of Autocon UK, is that right? Yes, so the Autocon UK is an organisation that was set up to help those who are neurodiverse, um, who are on the autistic spectrum and a lot of those people find it really difficult to get work so therefore it's really important that they get the support and encouragement to find the roles that they need and that's about creating the, uh, them into and developing them into IT consultants so that they can go and deliver for clients and we put measures in place so that they can be very fulfilled in that role and that they can deliver the work in a way that supports their, their neurodiversity. But I've worked a lot around gender as well over the years in creating charters for women, getting businesses to sign up to the importance of, of diversity and women in the workplace, a real focus around leadership and getting women onto, onto boards. So it's, there's definitely progress has been made. But there is still more to do just to create that fairer society that we all want to see where everyone gets a chance to progress and no one is left behind. Well, you're talking there about women and I know you said that progress has been made, but the statistics also show that COVID has had such a detrimental impact on the progression of women in organisations, in companies and, and many stepping back. You're a powerful female role model. You can tell that you're absolutely passionate about this subject. What messages would you like to give to women out there about resilience, about keeping going? I mean, it is a constant struggle sometimes to just get that work-life balance right. Um, we need to have more women in key roles. We need them at the, the senior levels of organisations. And is that a real driver for you? It's really important that we support women to, to progress and be the best they can be. And we need, therefore, that pipeline of talent right throughout an organisation, which means starting off about how we teach girls in school and get them involved in STEM and other subjects which they haven't typically gone into because there's just so many opportunities for them out there and I think as women progress and you mentioned about COVID and the challenges there, I think for a lot of this it's and I'd always say to women just keep believing in yourself and your capabilities. Create a support network around you, whether that is 
friends, family or colleagues or mentors and sponsors of people who can help you get to that, that next stage. And many of them have been through the challenges that you have. So therefore, by sharing it and helping understand some of those difficulties and complexities, you may find solutions easier as part of what you're doing. There's so many opportunities for you to make those choices about what is right for you. And therefore, you know, we want to help and support and get in there, giving you that confidence, giving you the de any development or just support that you need. The more that other people, and this is where we need men to be the champions of women in the workplace, because without that male allyship, we're not going to get anywhere. Without the senior, whether it's the chief executives or the C-suite in business, really believing that diversity is important. And yes, it's important because it's the right thing to do, but it's also important for the business and for the economy at large. If women in the UK were setting up and scaling businesses at the same rate as men, it'd be £250 billion to the economy. So mm -hmm. there's a huge reason for doing this. But for me, it's about it's also about the right thing to do and allowing everyone to succeed. What was it like being a, a, a woman politician? Because it seems from looking at the awfulness on social media that it's a bear pit and, and very cruel at times. I gave it my all. And that's the best that we can do. I literally, whether it was doing the case files, 22,000 case files over five years of people who really needed support, who had barriers that they were facing in, in life and really needed someone to stand by their side and help them through the challenges they had. And so whether it was that at a local level, whether it was really supporting the organisational communities and organisations and the charities that were working hard to drive change and support those in need. But it was, again, connecting business leaders and networks and, and having the conversations with the key decision makers around the table to make decisions about what you needed to, to change in the areas and the villages and towns that, that we worked in. So the great thing about politics is that it gives you, because you're elected, it gives you an opportunity and a platform to speak, to really talk about the things that matter. And whether that's locally, nationally or internationally, that if we can drive change in some way on our doorsteps in our own communities, but also take that message out to the wider world, then we should absolutely do that. So it's it was it was a good training ground um, <laughs> for actually understanding what BITC does and the things that are important to campaign on and focus on driving change. I'm going to ask you a question. Honest answer. Do you miss it? I will always miss a little bit of politics because you can use it for good. But I must say, given the resilience and everything else that's needed in politics these days, that you can do just as much outside. And I say that when I go into schools and speak to school children, we can all take something we care about and do something about it. And we've seen it in Malala, we've seen it in Greta. And no matter what age you are, you can take something and say, I'm going to actually, because I believe in it and I'm passionate about it, I can really do something about it. And that's where I think we've got to get great at telling our stories. We want to encourage our businesses that we work with to, to tell their stories because those stories do, people will remember them. People will talk about them to someone else and that will inspire another organisation or, or someone to do something different. So we need to keep telling those stories of impact and the change that, that we're making. And that helps in terms of being the voice for hope around the country when so many bad things are happening that we can actually say there are opportunities, there are things that we can do to make things better and let's work with you to actually achieve it. And we all want to hear those stories and The Lens is full of episodes of wonderful leaders who are sharing their stories, public speaking, speaking out, finding your voice, telling your stories and feeling like you have something to say that's worth hearing. Did you always feel you had that, Mary? I always felt that I could speak my mind. I think that probably came from being in a family where my mother sent us out volunteering from the age of 10, I think it was, uh, working with the Red Cross in the local hospital and taking, she would make soup and we would take it out around the local community to old people who needed some help over the weekend. I think open-minded and seeing what is around you. When I came to London first, 
I literally would go to work. I was working really long hours. I'd go to work. I'd go home, sleep, maybe go to the gym, see friends, perhaps at weekends if I could. But literally, I didn't notice what was going on in two streets away and and the things that were happening, both the difficulties and the challenges that people were going through, but also the amazing organisations and volunteers that were the unsung heroes and doing incredible work. So I think what it was, was that I just felt that there was definitely something that we all have. We have a voice and we should have that confidence to use it in any shape or form. And I did that during the first ceasefire in Northern Ireland. Um, I went, I was asked to help with the Northern Ireland peace process. And I went, I was just a junior consultant at the time, but I literally went with a group of others to put, put together ideas for peace for Northern Ireland. And it really struck me there was that we were just four or five normal people who had a real interest and passion in making our communities better and safer. And we literally just came up with our ideas of what could happen and presented them at that meeting that was full of politicians and and the people involved in that peace process. I'm thankful for the opportunities that I've had and people have believed that I can contribute, but everybody can contribute. And that's the message that, you know, I want to give everyone is that we all have a voice. We all have the ability to give ideas and to think about what's important and necessary and and solutions to, to problems in the world. And if we do that together, we will absolutely create a fairer, greener society that will really create a change, not just for now and in our lifetimes, but for future lifetimes as well. Now, Mary, business in the community's mantra is for businesses to go faster, braver and bolder in their actions for the benefit of people and the planet. And I want to talk to you about how businesses can actually do that. But I also want you to send a message to those business leaders who are perhaps too busy doing business to get involved, to tell those stories, to find their voice. What would you say to them today to stop them in their tracks and make them sit up and listen? And then this is an important moment to, there's been unprecedented change and, and uncertainty in the world that we live in today. And that therefore, this has become not just uh, the right thing to do, but it's become a business imperative. You know, the employees are looking for a business led organization and business led led leaders and customers are looking and with and scrutinizing what you're doing and how you're doing it investors are looking at the social value that, that you're creating ESG is, is now part of everyday language so therefore this is something that is absolutely critical to your business success and it's not just that we want you to say it in in words that's just not enough is that you've got to truly and utterly believe it and if you don't get it then come and see it for yourself join us on one of our C is believing visits to really see what is going on in society and how you can be part of that change because we can only do this and i really believe in the faster braver bolder mantra and um, we have to work together for the benefit of people and planet and be focused on that mission and we can't wait another 50 years for change let's make that change happen now and those business leaders can absolutely be part of that change and help lead and shape it you are, of course, the CEO of BITC, but I just want to know more about the person. And you've already mentioned that you've done an awful lot of work for marginalised groups and communities, uh, not only here in the UK, but overseas also. So I literally went out to, I went to Liberia with Save the Children to work on maternal health and drive a campaign for them there. I went out to Rwanda and taught I did several things in Rwanda. I taught marketing to the tourist industry to help them build up sort of their feeling about Rwanda. I did work in microfinancing and also literally I taught IT to street kids where I had a room of about 70 street kids and really dodgy electricity and two computers that didn't really work. <laughs> and so I remembered a story of a guy in South Africa where he literally was trying to build a uh, university for free. And before they could get any computers for all the, the youngsters, he literally photocopied a keyboard onto cardboard and they say, he handed them out to all the students saying, learn to type on this and you'll be typing 60 words a minute by the time the computers arrive. And I that night went home to my hotel and back to my hotel in Rwanda in Kigali. And I went, right, we're going to photocopy keyboards. And I handed them out and everyone just saw this amazing present they got them um, and I said learn to type on this cardboard keyboard and you'll and that that's a, the first step but yeah I was trying to find solutions but the the work on female fetus eggs were killing off female babies in India 
So that was quite powerful because the the all the media came out for it because it was uh, it was a female politician from another country um, doing the work. And then and in Bangladesh, it was I just couldn't believe. I mean, there were eight year old girls getting married off to sixty year old men, and if they ran away. They literally, be- and also they would end up having children far too young before the bodies were properly fully formed. They, if they ran away, they would get acid thrown over them, and then they'd be ostracised from society, ostracised from their families. And we went to this the acid survivors hospital, and these, I mean, we were just so moved because these young girls were crying with with just the fact that we had gone to see them and that they were just so moved that we'd bothered, and we were like, oh my god! So we of course lobbied the prime minister and um, a and tried to see what change we could do with acid in Bangladesh. But yeah, it's just there's there's so many major atrocities out in the world, and 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 we all can just do something to and speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves. This girl came to me one day and said, I'm in a care home and I I go to school. I go to after school classes. I then go to the, the library to finish off my homework. It closes at seven. We then go back to the care home and 20 of us are sharing a PC. Can you do anything to help? So I went to local businesses and said, have you got some spare old laptops that you can give? And there's, you know, just in my bar in London that are... Um, you know, 350 kids in care looked after children who, through no fault of their own, have had had such an awful start in life. And and all we're doing, and this is what we end up doing in business in the community, is we're pulling people together to say, yeah, of course we can help. We can't do everything as BITC, but we can use all those businesses we're connected to and those business leaders and people who really care about the communities they, they live and work in to help solve some of those problems. Because often these problems, it isn't rocket science. It's just really simple solutions to help those who are most in need. I absolutely want to see a better world. Um, I want to see a community that is fairer and better where everyone gets the chance to succeed. And therefore, it's, for me, it's all about impact. It's about purpose. That's why I do, I've done the work in local communities, done that work internationally, because I can see firsthand from individuals that come and ask me for help, whether it's organisations who see some of those issues and challenges elsewhere around the world, that working together, we absolutely can help make that change happen and and make a difference to it. And that's what's driven me over the years. And Mary, you can be part of that change too. We all can, as you said. I asked this question of all the guests, so of course I'll be asking it to the new CEO of Business in the Community. What are you committed to doing more of or less of or both in the coming year? Well, there's a lot to do, as as you've just heard, but I will absolutely be committed to having more ambition, more impact, more outreach, more vocal. My full commitment is around to use the strength we have and the numbers that we have in our network as in business in the community to really unlock the opportunity and to really drive action. And um, it's convening that network of purposeful leaders, driving greater impact, and it's got to be at pace and scale to change even more businesses, transform more lives and help more communities to thrive. So I will absolutely be at the front and centre of that and encouraging those 10,000 leaders working in the 50 places, building that network to over 50% of the workforce to really help us see and then create that magic to drive the change that we all want to see in the world around us. Mary McLeod, thank you so much for joining us on The Lens today. We wish you every success for the future and thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you, Sarah. You've been listening to The Lens with me, Sarah Travers. And if your business would like support in tackling the cost of living crisis or to be inspired by what others are doing and discover how responsible business is good business, then Business in the Community is open to new members. Please visit www.bitc.org.uk to avail of the Cost of Living Action Plan, a vast array of free resources, and to find out more about the advisory services on offer. We'll see you next time.